in the event that the judiciary rules in our favor, we shall be ready to run from day one. Now it's time to move, uh, to move forward and to encourage everybody that uh, we want to work together. Barring the hatchet, Uhuru and Mudavadi reunited. Nail art redefined, Meru donkeys get a pedicure. And Egyptian side Al Ahli snatch valuable away victory against Tasca FC. Many thanks for joining us. Now, exactly a week after Jubilee's Uhuru Kenyatta was declared the winner of the presidential ballot, rivals called finally filed their petition at the Supreme Court, seeking the annulment of the presidential election. Court is confident it has a strong case and is hoping the judges in the highest court in the country will confirm the alleged irregularities in the presidential election and call for a rerun of the poll. Sofia Wanuna starts our coverage tonight of this eventful day from the Supreme Court. It was a busy day at the Supreme Court Saturday, the deadline by which a petition could have been filed challenging the presidential election. <laughs> supporters gathered outside the Supreme Court here to witness the historic moment the filing of the first ever petition challenging a presidential election moments after midday the coalition for reforms and democracy courts legal team filed their petition at the Supreme Court registry led by the lead counsel George Oraro the respondents are the chairman of independent electoral commission the elect president Uhuru Kenyatta and elect deputy president William Ruto. All right. So three respondents to your petition? There are four respondents and I, IEBC. After successfully filing their petition, members of the court team addressed their supporters outside the law courts. <laughs> Civil Society Group, Africa Center for Open Governance, AFRICOG, were also here to file a petition before the deadline. They too want the presidential election nullified. We have sued the IEBC. Uh, obviously, Ahasan Isaka is the returning officer for the presidential election. Uh, and uh, as, as is traditional, the person who was declared the winner has, of course, to be sued. Away from the Supreme Court, President-elect Uhuru Kenyatta, who is a respondent to both petitions, said that he respects the law and would abide by the court ruling. In the event that the judiciary rules in our favor, we shall be ready to run from day one. In the event that they rule any other way, we are ready to go back to the people. The third petition before the Supreme Court was filed Thursday by three petitioners affiliated to the Jubilee Coalition. They want the court to determine whether IEBC should have factored in rejected votes in calculating the presidential results. And as a historic legal battle looms, Judiciary's Chief Registrar assured Kenyans that they would be able to follow the hearings once they commence on live TV. That means there will only be one media house inside the Supreme Court uh, building inside the Supreme Court itself and then they will feed that signal to all the other media houses. The Supreme Court has 14 days within which it must determine the petitions. Sophia Wanuna, KTN. Right, so the Supreme Court has 14 days. The petition has been filed. A lot is at stake. KTN's note now looks at what really is involved in this petition. Thank you so much, Linda. Now, the Code Alliance legal team is pretty confident of emerging victorious based on the several grounds presented in the petition. This includes one in which it claims that a farm known as Kenkol, based here in Nairobi, is hosting the servers for both TNA and the IEBC. Code argues that this could have compromised the confidentiality of the data that was sent to IEBC servers by possibly giving TNA access to that data. But that is not the core of the court petition. Court is asking the Supreme Court to nullify the results of the presidential election uh, declared by the IEBC Chairman Isaac Hassan last Saturday. Why? They are asking the court that the court nullifies the declaration of Uhuru Kenyatta and 
uh, William Ruto asked his deputy as the winners of that presidential election. God also wants the whole electoral process declared null and void. Whether this means just the presidential election or the whole general election of March 4th remains to be confirmed. So what are God's reasons for calling for nullification of the election results? Look at this. God argues that the IEBC and the IEBC chairman Isaac Hassan failed to establish systems which are accurate, secure, verifiable, accountable, and transparent. Hence, they say there were no free or fair presidential elections. They also argue that the voter register was altered so many times that there is no, that there is no way of telling which final register was used in the election proper. Their petition says that up to 85,000 registered voters were in the list given as registered voters in the published results more than there were in the voters roll as given at, eight, as at 18th uh, December last year. Another ground for the court petition, of course, is that the failure of the electronic voter identification devices, the biometric voter registration kits, and the electronic results transmission created opportunities for abuse and manipulation of the March 4th elections and the tally. Uh, so, they say that uh, the one the election declared null and void also on the ground that some of the cases, in some cases, uh, the valid votes cast as declared exceeded the registered voters in those areas. They say that this made them suspect that there were instances of stuffing of ballot boxes or inflation of figures to favor Huru Kenyatta and his deputy William Ruto. Court also says that some of the results declared at the National Tiling Center at Bomas were fundamentally different from those declared at the polling stations in Form 34. This is why Court argues that this election was a sham and therefore they want it uh, nullified. Back to you, Linda. Noah, thank you very much. No, Tenu, they are looking at the reasons why Court is filing this particular petition at the Supreme Court. Now, the police service has banned all political gatherings, demonstrations and prayer rallies outside designated places of worship, terming them a threat to peace. The ban came in the wake of a clash between police and court supporters who had assembled outside the Supreme Court as court's legal teams filed an election petition. The ban also comes just a day before a Thanksgiving prayer meeting scheduled to take place at Uhuru Park tomorrow. Wilkis Tanyabwa reports. <laughs> Early Saturday morning, supporters of the Coalition for Reform and Democracy assembled waiting for court's legal team to file the election petition challenging the election of Uhuru Kenyatta as Kenya's fourth president. However, the peaceful demonstration degenerated into a confrontation with police as the morning wore on, culminating in police firing tear gas to disperse the protesters. It was no surprise then that later in the morning, the police service called a news conference to map out new security arrangements. The police service has now banned political gatherings on the grounds that such assemblies may lead to tension and is now urging Kenyans to disengage from the campaign mood. There are instances which have been noted where groupings of people still come together to discuss politics. This is not acceptable since it has the potential to generate unnecessary tension and strain the harmonious existence currently enjoyed by our people. Also banned are demonstrations which any group may be planning to stage to register their displeasure. These demonstrations are illegal and members of the public are advised to keep off from them. The police then going on to throw a spanner in the works for religious organizations planning prayer sessions outside their designated places of worship. This announcement prompting the cancellation of a peace service by the Faith Evangelistic Ministries scheduled for Uhuru Park on Sunday. We have been informed that in the interest of continued peace and stability of our nation, all public gatherings have been cancelled. Consequently, the National Christian Prayer Service scheduled to be held tomorrow Sunday, 17th March 2013, from 2 p.m. at Uhuru Park, has been postponed until further notice. It's going to happen. Yeah, we'll come back and worship God. Yeah, it's going to happen. We just pushed it for the dates. 
These measures coming into play just hours after students at Kenyatta University went on the rampage after ballot boxes bearing IEBC stickers were found at the university. Kenyatta University was one of the telling centers for the IEBC and the materials were rightly there. The message reverberating even as a crowd that gathered in town Saturday morning dispersed. Wilkie Sinabwa, KTN, Saturday night. And just before the petition was filed, Prime Minister Raila Odinga addressed a press conference at his office saying they will pursue judicial redress as the judiciary remains the most trusted institution in the country. The PM says through the judiciary, they're confident of overturning the election of President-elect Uhuru Kenyatta in a bid to curb future electoral malpractices. The multiple failures of the IEBC, in fact, reflect failures of so many of our new institutions. But the one institution in which all Kenyans still have faith is our new judiciary. It is a faith based on the achievements in the last two years. The new Kenya, the courts have invested with enormous powers, including the power to curb the unlawful use of the authority by the executive and of course, the IEBC. Let me conclude by saying that the, the march of democracy can no longer be stopped in Kenya. Your commitment to the rule of law and to peace has put to shame the prophets of doom who were convinced the supporters of the declared, lo or the declared losers of the fourth march would embark on a bloody course. But those same prophets are now warming, warning that the violence looms around the corner at any of the constitutional steps that lie ahead in resolving this election dispute. They are using this scare tactics to prevent Kenyans from supporting the constitutional process now underway for the Supreme Court to legitimize the election of the next president. Right, with the petition now filed, the nightmare begins for the legal teams of the two coalitions preparing for a showdown at the Supreme Court with hundreds of evidence to sift through. The tallying of the presidential ballot will now be scrutinized and audited closely by the Supreme Court based on the grounds presented by the petitioners. KTN's Eric Joker spoke to legal experts. We will be bringing you that story in just a few minutes. But for now, let's keep our eyes on President-elect. And after sealing the post-election deals, President-elect Uhuru Kenyatta headed to the coast region for the weekend with his family. Uhuru jetted into Ukunda airstrip Diani this afternoon in two Air Force jets, one for him and the other for the First Lady. He also had President Kibaki's former security detail and the presidential press service in tow. Ferdinand Omondi reports. The red carpet was laid out all the way to where the plane would taxi to a stop. The guests were seated. So was the provincial administration. Security was tight. The big man was coming to town. Moser arrived here as early as 8 a.m. when he was initially expected, but it wasn't until 3 p.m. that the skies revealed an oncoming plane. And when it landed, it was the Air Force Dash 8 plane, the type that was normally assigned to the Prime Minister. Only this time... It was President-elect Uhuru Kenyatta. Out he came, accompanied by his wingman in this part of the country, Jirao Ali Mwakwere. And the procedural pleasantries began, the first hand to shake his being that of the provincial commissioner. Lined up along the red carpet were mostly TNA party officials and candidates who lost their bids on a TNA ticket in the coast region. And when he got to the dancers, the typical dancing Uhuru Kenyatta of the campaign season was gone. In his place was the president-elect, firmly on his feet, but smiling broadly in acknowledgement. While he signed the visitor's book, a second Air Force jet arrived. Amid the push and show of the security detail, we saw her. It was the first lady in waiting. When the formalities were done, the president-elect addressed the small but eager crowd at the airstrip. He said he was just visiting. 
tuambie ya kwamba sisi tuko tayari kufanya kazi pamoja tuunganishe Kenya na tuhakikishe kwamba tumeleta maendeleo kwa wote au namna gani hivi ndivyo tuliomba wa Kenya na tunaendelea kuendelea zaidi si hivi Mungu na abariki asante sana and with that Kenyatta drove off in a cloud of dust towards Diani KTN established that he would spend the weekend with his family at the exclusive Al Manara Beach Resort known for hosting the high and mighty. Celebrities like Real Madrid coach Jose Mourinho spent his nights here when he visited Kenya three years ago. Ferdinand Mondi, KTN, Diani. Let's now move to that story by Eric Joker and the nightmare begins for the legal teams of the two coalitions preparing for a showdown at the Supreme Court with hundreds of evidence to sift through. The tallying of the presidential ballot will now be scrutinized and audited closely by the Supreme Court based on the grounds presented by the petitioners. KTN's Eric Njoka spoke to legal experts on the scheduled petition. Here is what he found out. The filing of the petition means that the procedural Supreme Court presidential election petition rules 2013 comes into play. There are steps and procedures to be followed as outlined within the timelines provided in the Constitution. According to the petition rules, the seven days after the declaration meant to be within the timeline of filing the petition have already been dealt with. The next step is for the court to take its course and publish notification of the filing in the Kenya Gazette and a national newspaper under the office of the registrar. Thank you. A response from the respondents or the accused that include the president-elect, his deputy and the IEBC need to have been submitted to the court within three days. Let's be peaceful. Let's allow the judges an opportunity to hear the case and make their determination. And also assure them that the judiciary, as several times the Chief Justice has assured, that we are a fair court. A meeting between the Supreme Court judges and counsel of the various parties known as the pre-trial conference is then held nine days after the filing of the petition, whose aim is to frame the contested and uncontested issues and consolidate petitions if more than one has been filed, among other tasks. Although at this stage there was skepticism as to the duration of the process, some arguing it might take three months to sort out the modalities. It will be imperative for the parties concerned and even for the court itself to actually be able to live within these guidelines of the Constitution. The issue that people may actually say that three months, one year, that is basically beyond the law and besides the law. The law is very clear that a presidential petition will actually be held, uh, uh, will actually be heard and determined within 14 days. And once there's a presidential petition in place, then the swearing in of the president elect cannot take place until this. Um, this petition has been determined. So if you're talking about three months, if you're talking about one year, it means the country stays without president for that long, which cannot be the position in law. Two days within the pre-trial conference and with a properly constituted court comprising not less than five judges, the court proceeds with a hearing of the cases uninterrupted, meaning the proceedings will be held on a day-to-day -day basis until its conclusion. When they are making the determination at the end of it, they can actually just give the gist of their determination and the end results of it, but reserve for a later date the reasoning behind it. So that in their judgment, the reasoning as to, you know, the reasoning would carry the bulk and would take much longer to write. But really the gist of it is something that they have to deliver within the 14 days of filing. Within 14 days after the filing, preferably on the 30th of March, a decision is made by the court that determines the petition. That decision shall be final and cannot be contested. Eric Njoka, KTN. So away from the petitions, the Amani Coalition is back in the Jubilee Alliance fold after President-elect Uhuru Kenyatta and Amani's Musalia Mudavadi penned a new deal that guarantees Amani a stake in government if Jubilee wades through the presidential poll dispute. Uhuru told Mudavadi that he will be joining the alliance as a partner and not cheerleader. Other fringe parties that sealed the post-election pact with the Jubilee Alliance include Omingo Magara's PDP, Wavinyandeti's CCU, Kadu Asili, Ford People, and the Alliance Party of Kenya. Patrick Amimo reports. Mudavadi was at Uhuru's residence for the second time this week, and today it was to sign a post-election power-sharing deal with the Jubilee Coalition. 
The Amani coalition brings together UDF, New Ford Kenya and Kanu. But Kanu leaders were absent. The Amani team uh, is ready uh, to have that cooperation of purpose and to make sure that we are able to push forward progressive uh, and tangible uh, ideas and results. Other fringe parties in the deal include Kiraitu Murungi's APK, Omengo Magara's PDP, CCU led by Wavinya Ndeti who contested for Machakos County governorship and lost, Kadu Asili and Ford People led by its leader Henry Obocha. Curiously, both PDP and CCU campaigned under the Code Alliance and supported Prime Minister Raila Odinga's presidential bid. Sina haya kusema nilikuwa ndani ya code. Nilikuwa ndani ya code, atukuwa na agreement yoyote ndani ya code. Tulikuwa tumeandika mkataba, tuandike, tufanya kazi pamoja, lakini atuku say nchochote. We tried to do analog, no work, the computer couldn't open, <laughs> we couldn't find our network, we have now finally settled, and I believe this is where we belong. There have been fears from my members of parliament that they might not be put in the relevant committees in the house. As members of this family, we believe you as the fathers will ensure that your children are all taken care of. The final details of the power sharing deal are yet to be made public. We do not take you as cheerleaders in our coalition. We take you as partners. We take you as our own fellow Kenyans with every right to air your views and to put your positions across. You have come here so that you can add impetus to us delivering the national, the national agenda that we have for this country with you as partners. There was drama last December after TNA delegates rejected a secret deal Uhuru and Mudabadi had crafted. He had decided to withdraw his candidature and wished to support me as the coalition candidate. Shaitani ambaye hata hajui kazi hiyo tulianzisha namna gani. Wanakuja wanasema sasa sasa yule aliweka sahihi ni yule ambaye alikuwa pale akaweka sahihi. Sasa kama yeye anaruka ni yeye akiruka lakini wa Kenya wamtazame ili wakati wa kupiga kura wahakikishe kwamba wanapiga kura watu wasiwe wakigeuka wananchi ambao wanawachagua PDP won the Migori governor seat and Mohoroni parliamentary seat under the Code Alliance The winner skipped this function where party leader Omingo Magara joined Jubilee coalition However CCU's two MPs attended the deal signing the parties signing the new agreement have 21 days to deposit the coalition agreements with the Registrar of Political Parties. It will be interesting to see how the Code Alliance will handle this issue ahead of inauguration of county assemblies, Senate and Parliament. Patrick Amimo, KTN. The Law Society of Kenya will form an independent committee to audit the IABC with regard to the recently concluded general election. IABC is currently facing a growing number of legal battles over the way it conducted the March 4th polls, most notable being the petition filed today challenging the presidential election results. Speaking after the LSK annual general meeting, Chairman Eric Mutua said the lawyer's body will name a nine-member committee on Monday that will consist of experts in electoral law, information technology, civil societies and litigators to table its report in a month's time. We are interested in the wider picture and the wider picture is to have an audit, independent audit of the entire electoral process from uh, the registration of voters to civic education to the general preparedness of the electoral body. We want to have an audit of the entire process. We are not concerned that we have a time limit about it. All we are concerned with is an audit or a report which would help the country, it would help the law society, it would help IEBC to improve on its mandate and to make sure that um, they have been able to address 
the issues and the gaps which are manifested uh, itself during the just concluded general election. So You're watching KTN Saturday Night Live just ahead. Donkeys get special treatment. Stay with us. Many thanks for staying with us on KTN Saturday Night Live. Now, many Kenyans know that President Kibaki is an economist and matters of development are close to his heart. But what they do not know is that he underwent a lot of challenges in his childhood. His enrollment to school was necessitated by a government order that required each household to surrender one male child. It is a story of inspiration that President Mwai Kibaki came from a very humble background to become the President of the Republic of Kenya. KTN's Carol Derry spoke to some of Mwai Kibaki's siblings in Othaya and brings us the following interesting story. Odaya constituency is definitely a model constituency. The remarkable infrastructure and amenities and its people give credit to a man who has been their legislator for almost four decades. Thirty-eight years to be precise since 1974 and served as Kenya's president for 10 years. Mimi husikini na mpinga mtu. Mimi kama najua pombe huko. Mambo mengine. Si juu yangu kuda kusema juu yako. But everything has a beginning, and to get the gist of this genesis, we embark on a journey together with our colleagues from the Standard newspaper to find out just who this man, Emilio Mwai Kibaki, is. Our mission leads us to Gatoyaine area of Odaya. Meet Esther Waiderero. This is Kibaki's elder sister, a mother of four. At 98 years of age, her memory is impressive, so is her articulation of issues. And although she can only speak Kikuyu, Waiderero takes us down memory lane. When her little brother Mwai was born, she was old enough to assist her parents, John Kibaki Gedenji and Wanjuku Kibaki, tend to the young boy. <laughs> Back in the day when Waiderero and her seven siblings were growing up, there was no schooling, but a new administration forced each family to volunteer a male child to be forcefully enrolled in school. The young Mwai Kibaki was the youngest boy and was the one sent to school. The rest were left to tend to livestock, a chore considered more important then than attending school. I am interested to know what kind of a boy was Mwai Kibaki? Na niari mwana mwadiki. Nai gwa wari ena go. Oh. Mwai. Yeah. Agi ya kita suku we. Kau beru aku ni aku aku suku dulu ku. Kau tu nama aku dari sini. Aku tu nama dari luar. Dari sini tu aku ni dari kuli ba. Waiderero did not attend school since girls are not allowed to, but her mind is seemingly very sharp and we can't help but wonder where she would be now had she attended school. 
She makes beautiful baskets to keep herself busy and here she shows me what materials she uses and how she designs the patterns. She and her son Boniface Gedenji Gishuke lead a simple life. Gishuke speaks highly of his uncle. I like to say he has helped me because when I went to school, I mean, at our times we were paying fees. And very high, this time, at that time we were uh, going to school up to class, I mean to form six. And uh, at the A levels, uh, my mother couldn't raise my fees. Though being the president's nephew, it was not easy to see him as often as he would have wanted. Hakuna mtu anaweza saidia akamilishe kila kitu. Lakini kusema ukweli amesaidia hapa na pale bila kupagua. Ile kitu najua ni ati hakuna watu ati kusema ni familia yao amesaidia directly bila ku consider ama kuhesabu wale wagine wako karibu na yeye. So a few meters from Esther Waidereros home we meet President Kibaki's other sibling at his home. Meet Bernard Nderitu Kibaki, Mwai Kibaki's older brother. I was born in the house of my father. I was born in the house of my father. He recalls how they lived in a mud grass thatched home and how their father sold tobacco for a living just so that Mwai Kibaki's fees could be paid. Bernard did not attend school as each home was required to just produce one son for schooling. And have their lives changed in any way since their brother became president? Their advice to Kenya's fourth president, please emulate our brother's developmental track record and economic sense. Hapana onea mimi huruma. Hakuna haja. Hakuna haja ya kuonea huruma ati kwa sababu niko ati unaninahitaji ni punzike. Kwa ni punzike ni fanyi nini? Hapana. Tunahitaji kila mtu wafanye kazi kwa sababu wewe unahitaji ufanye kazi. Carol Ndari for KTN in Odaya constituency, Nyeri County. Brilliant, amazing story there by Carol Ndari. You don't get to see such kind of stories every day only on KTN. Kibaki's older sister, they are saying, he used to write on the soil, he couldn't hold the pencil and he loved to read. And of course she says she, was, she wishes she had her own car just to drive on the tarmac roads that her brother has ensured are there, only on KTN. Now, whenever you hear of manicures and pedicures, you think of ladies first. But how often does one get to see a donkey getting a pedicure? Residents of Meru were treated to the spectacle when a local organization arrived to train furious individuals who would boost the efforts of local veterinary doctors by trimming the overgrown hooves of donkeys. And while the humans worked, the donkeys enjoyed the break. Will Kistanyabo reports. It is not unusual to see donkeys pulling loaded carts in Meru town. What is unusual anywhere is catching a glimpse of a donkey getting a pedicure. 
But this is the site that residents of Merrytown were treated to when the Kenyan Network for Dissemination of Agricultural Technology, commonly known as Heshimo Punda, arrived to train locals so that they can take care of their donkeys, trimming their overgrown hooves. <laughs> Grace Makandi, a female trainee from Meru, is moving away from traditional norms. In times past, donkeys were not handled by women, but now Grace is training to become a handler. Niko na business ya ya kakoto na pika kakoto. Sasa funda ndio inaletea mawe. Funda sinaenda sinachukua mawe sinaweka hapo. Alafu napata faida ya 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 punda kutokana na kakoto. Sasa mimi nikaonelea kama mama kwa sababu nimenunua hii hisi punda na nisangu lazima ni tunze na nijitole ndio punda si hata mimi rafiki yangu. The training for persons from the community meant to ensure that trained individuals are always on hand. And so the trainees practice, trimming the hooves just as they would over grown nails, and just as one would do when giving a pedicure, filing off the rough edges so that the donkeys can move unimpeded. <laughs> Yeah, sio sio familia kama ngombe haina masiwa lakini hawajui punda inafanya kazi kuliko ngombe na ile faida ninapata ni ni afadhali iwe na na punda mbili kuliko ngombe kumi. Once they complete the program, the trainees shall be able to return to the communities and provide their services while earning a living. But today they get to exchange places. As the humans work, the beasts of burden take a load off. Wilkinson we'll Albo, KTN. Right, female genital mutilation continues to torment hundreds of girls in Elgeo Marquet County. Majority have had their education cut short after undergoing the outdated rite of passage. However, the newly elected woman representative of Elgeo Marquet hopes to bring an end to this dark cultural practice with a curriculum that offers an alternative rite of passage, empowering these girls to a bright future. KTN's Masikandie caught up with Dr. Susan and brings us this story. The steep valleys of El Geo Maraquet will face an even stiffer fight, the ongoing fight against female genital mutilation. <laughs> Yeah, and came back. The newly elected woman representative for El Geo Maraquet, Dr. Susan Chebet, says her passion to change the negative culture of the region will get a boost from her ascent to the post. I saw my surrounding and I thought I should be, be a change agent. The fight against FGM has been a tough one. Despite the practice being illegal, many still undertake the outdated rite of passage undercover. They, they come together as if they are uh, celebrating a birth of a baby. And so they even sing Christian songs and they are doing circumcision inside there. In 2012 alone, over 500 girls went under the knife in Maraquet area, a number Dr. Susan Chebet hopes to reduce with a curriculum for a program dubbed Tumdonelel, which offers an alternative rite of passage for these young girls, having so far graduated over 6,000 girls. Once they are uh, subjected to that, they cannot continue with their education, which means we are starting a fisher circle. They fall back to the poverty that is in the home. So Tumdanele program helps them to overcome all those and continue with their education so that in future they can be empowered and uh, take up leadership roles in their families, in the community, and also even at the national level. With four books to her name, Dr. Susan Chebet says, education remains the key to unlocking the potential in a girl's life. It, however, has not been all juicy for the newly elected woman representative with several hurdles in life, but one in particular, culture, being the toughest. I think we are a bit conservative. 
the the post of governor from most of the people they they looked at as a, they said it is the the county president the president of the county so they cannot imagine a woman being a president senator they said it is a tongue and so the tongue nobody tongue eh? the the ulimi they say it is women don't eat ulimi in our culture so that they used that to explain why women cannot be elected as senators so they say that position is for men first of all they wanted it to be for old men but i think the young generation snatched it from from the old men otherwise but they they had said it is for it is for men and then for other positions like mp they don't mind they don't mind a woman mp after receiving commendation from President Kibaki for her outstanding work against FGM, Dr. Chibet believes the battle to an empowered girl child is far from over. Born in Kewamwen village, a name to mean plain land, Dr. Chibet rose, dedicating her time to the community, with the work done so far making it easy for her during the campaigns. Married with three sons, she says the next five years she hopes more girls and boys will be empowered and in the long run, Elgeo Maraquet County will be the county that sets the pace. Masi Kandia Katian, Elgeo Maraquet County. That was Elgeo Maraquet. We have been to Nyeri and now we take you across our borders. And after more than two decades of being described as the most dangerous city in the world, Mogadishu is slowly shrugging off that title. The signs of nightlife in Mogadishu indicate improved security. As Kasi Mohammed now reports, businessmen and residents alike have a lot to smile about. As darkness falls in the seaside city of Mogadishu, nightlife takes shape. The once deserted streets of the Somali capital are back to life. Shops and restaurants are doing brisk business in some parts of the city well into the night. Mohammed Mahmoud Ragi, owner of the popular Dar es Salaam restaurant, is leaving nothing to chance to cash in on the growing number of customers. Nabat Supermarket is another business venture that's enjoying a boom. Customers can pick up items they didn't have time to do so during the day. Just two years ago, few residents of this city will have dared to stay out past sunset as various groups battle for control of the city. Fast forward and things have changed drastically. In August 2011, members of the Al-Shabaab were forced to flee their positions in the capital by the Somali National Army and the African Union Peacekeeping Forces, AMISOM. <laughs> Music and dance was banned during the Al-Shabaab rule, but Mogadishu recently played host to a famous Somali musician, Mohammed Hassan Hussein Lafoli. The concert highlighted just how much the city has changed. The relative peace in Mogadishu doesn't cover the whole country. Though weakened militarily, the Al Shabaab still controls a few areas of the Horn of Africa nation. Somalia faces many challenges, but the capital's growing nightlife is a sign that the residents here are singing a new tune that of peace. Will the 22 years of anarchy be replaced with pages of peace and development? The answer will take some time. Kasim Mohammed, KTN. It's really hard to believe that's Mogadishu. It looks quite to me like 
county all here in Nairobi when you have one of those theme nights and all the people and going. And everyone comes in Absolutely. and they have fun. <laughs> you wouldn't imagine that would be, that is Mogadishu. Mogadishu. Yeah. You're watching KTN Saturday Night Live. Thank you so much for staying with us. Sadiq Shaban is here. He has the details of what he has for you in sports. What yeah, including uh, good news that he was uh, whispering to me about Manchester. his team. <laughs> yes, winning in the English Premier League. That, rugby, motorsport, athletics and so much more coming up in just a tick. Stay with us. Welcome to KTN Saturday Night Sports. Kenya Premier League champions Task FC have a Herculean task of overturning a 2-1 goal deficit against Egyptian giants Alali in the second leg of the CAF Champions League. Despite having a large share of ball possession today and numerous chances, Robert Matano's boys were wasteful up front, but the Brewers coach believe they will come good in the second leg away in Egypt. Tusker was the better side of the two sides as they controlled the midfield winning loose balls. Jesse Were could have found the back of the net but was unable to control a long pass and Sheriff Ekrami bet him to the ball. Robert Omnuk's corner almost broke the deadlock for the Tusker League champions but Luke Ocheng failed to connect the resultant long ball. As the match progressed, the battle was concentrated in the midfield with both sides looking to outsmart the other. Ahmed Sadiq could easily have found the back of the net, but the first half ended with the match still at a knife edge. Al Ali's captain Ahmad Metaib turned the match on its head early into the second half as the Brewers looked disjointed at the back. With an upper hand, it's the Egyptian side that looked comfortable on the ball. Controlling the lounge share of ball possession with Ahmed Shokri and Adel calling the shots in midfield and opening up the Brewers' defense. Emad Metai headed in the second to kill the game. <laughs> However, they were caught napping on the rear guard as they allowed Tusker to reduce the arrears and former the United's forward Jesse Ware reduced Robert Matano's blushes. Tusker looked for an equalizer, but Al Ali held on for an important away victory, leaving Tusker head coach Robert Matano to pick up the pieces and a mountain to climb in the second leg. I like away because you don't play under pressure. You play on your own game and also they are, they are panicking because when you score one goal there, uh, it will be something different for them. They are not so comfortable too. So away game is always good because you play no pressure. With another Kenyan side, Gormaya falling to the hands of an Egyptian side, ANP, the two sides have about two weeks to break the Egyptian jinx of our Kenyan teams. Will they follow in the footsteps of Sofapaka? Reporting for KTN Weekend Prime Sports, I'm Hassan Juma. Elsewhere, Kenya Harlequins Rugby Club and Strathmore University Impala and Homeboys were tossed out of the Enterprise Cup after losing in the quarterfinals matches today. But the match between Impala and Mwamba was reduced into a one-man show, starring prolific IRB top scorer Collins Injera. High-flying university side Strathmore Leos will have to wait for another season to make another attempt at the Enterprise Cup rugby after losing out to Total Nondis at the Amadaraka home ground. Mitchell Chola's side looked set to make up for their Kenya Cup disappointment but wastefulness up front caused them the quarter-final clash as Nondis won 23-18. to 18. In Nakuru, hosts Menangai Oil Nakuru RFC marched into the Enterprise Cup semi-final emphatically, defeating immediate Kenya Cup champions launched by Queens by 21 points to 5 in a largely one-sided affair dominated by the Kenya Cup champions. At the University of Nairobi grounds, Kenya Sevens rugby team talisman Collins Injera scored six individual tries and helped set up three more as Mwamba routed Impala by 65 points to 21. Hundreds of Mwamba supporters chanted his name throughout the game, perhaps sending a message to the selectors of the National Rugby Sevens team. For me it felt great, uh, playing in the back row, really, 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 really demanding. But uh, scoring the six tries, uh, I feel it's good for me. By defeating homeboys RFC 26-15, KCB will now meet Menengai Oil Nakuru RFC in the semi-finals next weekend, while Total Nondis will host Mwamba at the Jamhuri Park grounds.
Elsewhere, 12 athletes have been selected to represent the country at the Pen Relays Championship in Pennsylvania, United States, after a two days championship at the Kasorani Stadium ended today. Athletes will use the U.S. Penny Relays to seek qualification and qualifying times for the 4x400 relay teams, uh, which hopefully uh, hopes to qualify for the World Athletics Championships in Russia. The event will also see the 4x800 meters women's race where former World Junior 800 meters silver medalist Kulicha Bet will be the country's only representative over the distance. Other athletes include sprinters Vincent Kosgei, World Youth 400 meters bronze medalist Alphas Kishoyan and Boniface Muresa. The relays will be held at the University of Pennsylvania Mostly in the April the from 25th to 27th. Everyone was using it as a build-up. We didn't want to strain a lot because of it's the first meeting of the year. We have a lot coming. We have one next week in Bondo, so we were taking it all easy. Yeah, hard enough to results come about when you're You have to competition from outside and you come easy. You're not going to get the appeal. Because the battle is going to be from speakers like Kitambo and Kutalu going to make can you qualify times? What's that going to make from outside the country? I thank you so much for your company on behalf of everyone here. Thank you so much for watching Sleep Well. I'm Linda. My name is Sadiq Shaban. Thank you very much. And Linda, we've received a lot of responses on that mm -hmm. story by, by Karunderi uh, from, from Neri. And uh, many people say they're just reading about it on social media. And perhaps <laughs> a lot of people would be asking whether the story can run again tomorrow. It's an amazing story. That's what we can tell you. We'll try and see if we can get it uh, run again tomorrow. Just and uh, most importantly, I know that our online team is working on that. So that story will be on our YouTube page at www.ktnkenya.tv. Or you can find us on YouTube at uh, KTN Kenya. Or better Sorry. still, you can cross your fingers that we have it again tomorrow. Tomorrow. Very <laughs> Sleep well. I'm Linda. I'm good too.